Professor Watanabe Yasushi. He is Professor of Public Diplomacy at the Graduate School of uh, Media and Governance at Keio University. He served in the advisory panel for public diplomacy on the, uh, of the Japanese Ministry of Foreign Affairs and has also chaired the advisory committee of NHK World. And this is very important because this is the Japanese public broadcaster. What, what Anabe Sensei, please. Yes, uh, thank you, Dean Danova, uh, for your kind introduction. And I'd like to uh, express my deepest gratitude to Professor uh, Evgeny Kandilov and the Japanese language department of Sofia University for organizing this event and inviting me and also to Mr. Boyko Vasiliev of Bulgarian National Television for moderating this session. Uh, also, it's a great honor to be with a, a very distinguished historian, uh, Ivan Ilichev of Sofia University. Um, if Bulgaria is famous for beautiful roads, uh, Japan is known for its cherry blossoms. And actually, we are heading into the uh, cherry blossom season in a few weeks. And my background here uh, is a cherry blossom in the moat of the Imperial Palace uh, from last year. And I hope that many uh, tourists uh, will come back to Japan from overseas, uh, including from Bulgaria, uh, once uh, this COVID-19 gets under control. Uh, today, um, I'd like to talk about how I see the trajectory of Japanese soft power, and especially uh, in the areas of culture and cultural uh, relations. So I can now turn to the... I'd like to turn to share my slide. So could you allow me to do so? The first, uh, I just, this is just a quick uh, definition of soft power. And soft power is the power of attraction uh, rather than coercion or payments, or in other words, the ability to win the hearts and mind of others and thus secure the best environment for pursuing national and global interests. So to put in short, uh, it's the ability to make friends and allies and culture and political values and foreign policies are the primary resources of soft power. This is relatively a new concept, but the soft power related approaches have a longer history in Japan. Uh, for example, the Tokugawa shogunate accepted invitation from Napoleon III to participate in the Paris Exposition of 1867 and six years later, uh, the Meiji government allocated uh, as much as 1% uh, of its entire annual uh, national budget to Japan's participation in the Vienna expositions of 1873. And Japan's exhibits at these expositions created the so-called Japanese frenzy uh, in Europe's art world leading to the uh, establishment of museums devoted to Japanese and other Asian arts. Uh, then um, after the Second World War, uh, Japan faced the challenge of transforming its image as a militaristic aggressor into that of a democratic and peace-loving nation. So Japan's soft power engagement cautiously avoided materials likely to allow association with the way of the samurai and with other elements of Japan's feudal past. Instead, it highlighted more benign images of Japanese culture, uh, such as the tea ceremony and ikebana flower arranging. As a matter of fact, uh, ikebana has remained an emphasis in Japan's public relations to this day, as seen in the photographic calendars published and distributed annually by the Japanese government. Anyway, uh, it was uh, uh, right after the Lost War and Japan was under occupation for the first time in history. So Japanese people were not confident uh, with their cultural identity and Japan did not have much resources for cultural engagement. Uh, but the Japanese economy attained 
convincing momentum in the 1960s, the Shinkansen bullet train line was completed in uh, 1964, uh, right before the first Tokyo Olympics. And one of the legacies of the Tokyo Olympic uh, was that uh, it was the first event in the world uh, in which the pictogram was used rather uh, extensively. Uh, so, uh, because Tokyo had so many visitors from all around the world, uh, Japan had to deal with uh, uh, the language problem and the pictogram was very useful uh, in that sense. And it, it began used worldwide uh, thereafter. Uh, on the other hand, uh, by the early 1960s, the Japan had the trade frictions with United States and Southeast Asia. So in 1972, uh, Japan's parliament passed a bill to establish the Japan Foundation, or Koksai Koryu Kikin, uh, for the purpose of promoting mutual understanding. So uh, to put it short, unlike the previous period, right after the Second World War, the Japanese people gained more confidence in asserting their cultural uniqueness. And also it became necessary to do so in order to defend Japan's new presence in the global economy. Uh, however, uh, critical voices continued to arise in the United States in the uh, 1980s, calling for Japan to shoulder more responsibility as a member of the international community. So pressure mounted for Japan uh, to provide support for multilateral peacekeeping operations and to um, expand its assistance for uh, developing nations. And that discontent had worsened over the first Gulf War in 1991 uh, because uh, Japan was not able to take part in the UN authorized uh, military action uh, because of our uh, constitutional uh, restriction. So in 1991, the, the, the Japanese government decided to establish the Center for Global Partnership, or so-called CGP, inside the Japan Foundation. And its founding mandate was to promote the US-Japan cooperation in policy initiative aimed at addressing global issues of common concern. Uh, for example, uh, supporting democratization in developing nations and addressing, addressing threats to the environment, and combating uh, contagious diseases. And you can see the co-founders of the center here, uh, Secretary uh, George Schultz of the United States uh, and the Japanese Foreign Minister uh, Abe Shintaro, the father of former Prime Minister uh, Abe Shinzo. And I think the establishment of uh, the Center for Global Partnership was a turning point uh, in the history of Japanese soft power engagements in tackling uh, global issues of common concern through a multilateral approach. So with the Center for uh, Global Partnership, Japan, I believe, embraced a new paradigm. It began to emphasize its common ground uh, with other nations, not just uh, Japan's uh, uniqueness, and I will come back to this point uh, later. Um, another important developed stage, uh, especially um, after around year 2000, is that uh, Japanese contemporary culture began receiving uh, extensive attention, not only in East Asia, uh, but also in Europe and uh, in the United States. And certainly um, there were a certain number of Japan files uh, interested in traditional culture or high culture, uh, such as ukiyo-e, no, kabuki. Uh, even when I was studying in the United States in the 1990s, and such figures like uh, Kurosawa Akira, uh, Ozu Yasujiro, uh, Mishima Yukio, uh, Kawabata Yasunari, were popular subjects of research in the field of uh, Japanese studies. But uh, since around year 2000, a more contemporary side of culture became popular, uh, starting first with the manga and anime, and then gaming software, and also fashion, cuisine, architecture, and so on. And may maybe some of you know better than I do, but uh, Pokemon and Hello Kitty, 
and Hatsune Miku won a big market around the world. As some of you might remember, uh, former Prime Minister Abe appeared as a Nintendo uh, character, uh, game character Super Mario or Abe Mario uh, at the closing ceremony of the 2016 Rio de Janeiro Olympic. And of course, Mr. Abe uh, was a, a first Japanese Prime Minister uh, visiting the Republic of Bulgaria uh, three years ago. And Japan's Ministry of Economy, Trade and Industry embarked on a national branding campaign in uh, 2011 uh, to promote Japanese creative industries as Cool Japan Initiative. And the naming itself was uh, basically a copy of the United Kingdom's the Cool Britannia campaign during the Tony Blair administration. And already uh, artists like like uh, Kusama Yayoi, uh, Ozawa Seiji, Ono Yoko were well known, but the new figures like uh, Murakami Haruki, uh, Yoshimoto Banana, uh, Nara Yoshitomo, uh, Murakami Takashi uh, came into vogue. Uh, so have such architects like, uh, uh, like Ban Shigeru, uh, Kuma Kengo, and uh, Ando Tadao. And now it spreads even wider uh, from Uniqlo, uh, you, you can see Yoshimoto Banana on your left. And unique, uh, from Uniqlo to Marie Kondo, uh, uh, you can see on your right, uh, who is very popular as a tidying expert. And sushi restaurants are everywhere today. Uh, when I first went to the United States in 1990, eating raw fish was still considered very weird. Uh, by my American friends. So time has changed. And today, uh, Japan is more represented by those with multicultural backgrounds. Uh, for example, you can see on your left, then uh, Miss Naomi Osaka uh, is a professional tennis player uh, who recently won her second Australian Open title. Uh, her father is Haitian American. And, and Mr. Yu Darvish on your right uh, is now playing in major league in the United States and his father is Iranian. And I of course, this, I don't know how to pronounce in Bulgarian, but uh, on your left, you can see uh, uh, Aoyama uh, from Bulgaria uh, is famous in Japan, who joined the small world at the recommendation of Koto Oshu uh, on your right. Uh, who retired seven years ago, and now leads his own small stable called Naruto Stable. Uh, so Japanese soft power owes a lot to the uh, Bulgarian. And for your information, uh, one out of every 30 babies born in Japan today has at least one parent originating from overseas. And non-Japanese make up more than 20% of the new adults in central districts of Tokyo. So J Japan is getting a more heterogeneous society. But impacts of soft powers are always difficult to evaluate, especially hard to quantify. And causal relations are not easy to pin down. And often it takes years for any tangible results to come out. Uh, but according to a uh, recent soft power index uh, by a UK-based consulting company, uh, Japan ranks fifth in 2018, uh, following after the United Kingdom, France, Germany, and the United States. And other surveys show more or less the similar uh, results. And according to uh, Japan National Tourism Organization, the number of international travelers to Japan was just about 5 million 20 years ago, but it increased more than six times right before the, the, the COVID-19 took place. And in the same way, the number of international students in Japan's higher education was uh, just around 30,000 uh, 30 years ago when I was undergraduate student, but it increased uh, more than uh, seven times uh, right before the COVID-19. And this is a photo of the first uh, Japan house uh, opened in Sao Paulo, Brazil in 2017. And uh, it's a public private initiative to promote Japanese culture. And I was on the, uh, the advisory committee and our 
initial internal estimate of visitor was around 150,000. But in fact, uh, it attracted eight times more visitors in one year. Uh, from a soft power perspective, uh, this cool Japan uh, is very valuable uh, as a gateway to Japan, especially for young generation of foreign countries. Uh, some of them might choose to study Japanese language and culture and visit Japan or even pursue uh, Japan related careers. And they may get critical of certain aspect of Japan or certain policies of Japan, uh, but that's perfectly fine. At least uh, they tend to have a more nuanced and contextual understanding of Japan uh, instead of being susceptible to sound bites. And that's very precious. Uh, their presence can be particularly valuable, uh, valuable when the bilateral uh, relation face political tension over uh, certain issues. So um, Japan's soft power engagement have so far uh, seen some success uh, by taking advantage of Japan's unique culture, art, and language. But in the future, uh, it will be also necessary to increase Japan's soft power in the areas of universality. For example, serious pollution and suffered calamitous natural disasters. And we can share our experience much more with other parts of the world. And you can see a manga textbook for disaster prevention produced after the 3-11, the, the big earthquake on March 11, uh, 10 years ago. Uh, so that uh, even small kids in vulnerable region like uh, Indonesia or in, in South Pacific can prepare for future uh, disasters. At this uh, moment, very moment, uh, I, I'm not sure, uh, it's not certain uh, if Tokyo Olympic game take place this summer, but if it ever does, it should certainly be a great opportunity uh, to promote global solidarity to overcome COVID-19 and also uh, increase global awareness of diversity and sustainability. Uh, for example, um, in order to make as many as 5,000 metal, me medals, uh, about two tons of metal is necessary. And this time, uh, Tokyo has made all the medals using other mines. I mean, the, the metals recycled from discarded uh, electronic devices, including mobile phones and laptops. And actually, uh, Japan's foremost, diplom um, uh, foremost diplomatic uh, priority is, is to protect and defend the so-called liberal international order uh, based on democracy, the rule of law, human rights, uh, free trade, and so on. After all, uh, Japan was able to recover and prosper uh, thanks to this order after the Second World War. And this order is especially important and must be maintained uh, when anti-liberal phenomena, uh, such as the rise of authoritarian states, the unilateral change of status quo by force, and the proliferation of weapons of mass destruction have all become conspicuous. So in this regard, Japan and other like-minded democracies in Indo-Pacific and in Europe uh, can work together not only in security and trade, but also in the field of uh, soft power engagement. Uh, on your left, you can see uh, US President uh, Barack Obama uh, speaking in Hiroshima. And on your right, uh, you can see a prime, former Prime Minister Abe uh, speaking at Pearl Harbor in Hawaii. E events like these are a good example of joint soft power engagement toward reconciliation and also world peace. Uh, so yes, the being cool in creative industries is important, no doubt about it. But Japan's soft power engagement should go beyond cool in the next phase and further deepen, deepen ties among uh, liberal democracies and those who aspire for the liberal order in their society and in the world. And having said this, uh, Japan faces some challenges that could affect its own soft power engagement. And one of them, uh, I think, the, and also one of the most uh, urgent one is uh, the aging uh, and shrinking population. Uh, Japan's current population is about uh, 125 million. 
and has just begun to decline. And it is estimated to go down uh, below 100 million by year 2050. And those over age 65 is going to comprise 40% of the total population. And Japan can certainly be a leader in creating a new lifestyle in an aging society, uh, utilizing uh, new technologies and social innovation. And if Japan can present the so-called Japan model for uh, aging society, that will be a great asset for Japan's soft power. But if not, uh, it's, it will be a serious liability for Japan's future. Uh, for this purpose, Japan needs to be more socially inclusive, including women, minorities, and foreigners. And also, uh, um, this, is, this COVID-19 crisis has convinced me that uh, some of our institutional and regulatory culture is outdated. I mean, not agile enough to deal with new technologies and exploit emerging opportunities ranging from a work environment to educational system. So I, I, I believe more so-called more disruptive, uh, creative disruption is needed for Japan uh, to stay core. Uh, I think I should stop here. Thank you. My name is Karolina and I'm a fourth year student in the Japanese Studies Bachelor Program. Uh, in the Japanese Studies, we have a course of lectures that are specifically dedicated to Go Japan and Japan's uh, soft power, where we look at the topic in a more complex way and from different uh, perspectives. That's why I wanted to ask you, how does Japan respond to the rising South Korean soft power? Is it a threat to Go Japan? And if yes, are there any strategies to combat it? Thank you. Uh Yes, thank you very much. That's a very uh, good and timely uh, question. Um, well, I should say this. Uh, in 2004, I remember, uh, there's a very famous uh, Korean drama called uh, uh, Winter Sonata. And it made a huge sensation a hit in, in Japan. So many... Uh, many women in particular uh, was so attracted by the drama as so well started traveling to uh, South Korea and, uh, and to see to see the shooting site and actually I was one of the uh, those people uh, who went to see the uh, shooting site as well so I, I was fascinated by uh, Korean the, the Korean drama and also Korean the music pop pop music uh, like uh, uh, Girl Generations and BTS and, and so on. Uh, very popular in Japan. And actually in my seminar here on cultural relations or soft power, uh, usually uh, say among the 30 or 40 students, I, usually three or four students are very interested in uh, studying more about the Korean uh, pop culture or Hanryu. Uh, so their presence is, is very strong. And I think the Korean uh, government uh, has done a very good job uh, in creating the Center for, uh, center for uh, expanding the Korean cultural presence overseas. Um, and also, I believe that uh, the foreign, the consulates uh, in other parts of the world outside of South Korea are closely watching what kind of, uh, what elements of Korean culture uh, would attract the young audience of, of their respective countries. It's a music or a drama or it's cosmetic uh, and so on. And then report the research results back to Seoul. And then there's the, the foreign ministry uh, will uh, sort of think about, uh, the foreign ministry and the other agency will think about uh, how to promote uh, the Korean culture uh, uh, in those countries. So that's very systematically uh, and strategized. And so that, that's something I'm quite impressed. Um, so so uh, going back to what I said in 24, uh, so Korean drama uh, the, became very popular. And the Korean dramas were also cheap for broadcasting company to buy. 
So they bought uh, lots of the, the programs and aired uh, very constantly, uh, and then increased the number of Korean fans more. And so uh, one day, however, um, the some the sort of conservative Japanese uh, people started question the over presence of Korean pop culture on their broadcasting program. So started to uh, protest the too much uh, presence of Korean culture as kind of cultural uh, invasion to Japan. And around that time, the, the South Korean Japan relation got sore. So uh, some people are hesitant uh, uh, about or resistant about uh, bringing the uh, Korean singers and the dancers to Japan. Uh, however, uh, I'd say that's basically a very minority uh, in, in terms of the wide fans of uh, the, the, the Japanese fan of Korean uh, pop culture, uh, especially among the young generation, uh, including my students, uh, who know that uh, the South Korean Japan political relation is very tense. However, that's separate from the cultural exchange. So, um, it, so I don't think uh, the people in general, young people in particular, uh, any have uh, sort of a strong sort of a, don't feel it, it, it uh, scary at all. Uh, rather. Uh, the, the young generations, uh, I mean, the next generation for Japanese society, uh, very accommodating and enjoying the Korean uh, the pop culture. And as a matter of fact, the groups like uh, uh, that, I, I don't know if you know, but uh, there's a group called TWICE. It's a girls group uh, comprised with uh, seven or eight, nine women. Uh, but I, I think uh, uh, three girls are from Japan. So, and one one is from Taiwan. And so uh, it's kind of an international group. And so they are pre uh, playing in South Korea, but also in Japan, and they're very popular in Japan. So uh, there's a kind of collaboration or collaboratory efforts going on, a very interesting phenomenon, culturally speaking. So I, 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 I don't, I'm not any um, pessimistic about or any uh, critical of the current condition. Uh, my name is Rusica Tudorova. Uh, was Japan influenced by the United States in any way when choosing her politics for applying her soft power? Or do you think that Japan follows her own individual path? Well, uh, because we, we lost the war uh, in, in, in the Second World War. Uh, so Japan was a little bit, a uh, little bit very uh, passive and reserved in uh, ac actively pursuing the public diplomacy. And actually uh, using the word public diplomacy itself had a, a bit negative implication uh, for a long time because it uh, reminded people uh, of the propaganda uh, Japan did during the, uh, the wartime. So uh, even among the uh, the, the experts in international relations, some people did not like the term public diplomacy. Uh, rather, they prefer to use the term like a cultural exchange or cultural uh, relations or something like that. Uh, however, I think the situation changed um, after the 9-11-2001 uh, um, US has started very um, proactively and aggressively pursuing the public diplomacy endeavors. And the, uh, Japan was influenced by the American initiative and also in the, you know, the terrorism is uh, also a threat to Japan as well. And so Japan became more conscious of the security environment and tried to associate uh, more input, the strategic side to the cultural uh, relations or cultural uh, uh, activities. So in 2004 or five, 
the Ministry of Foreign Affairs started to use public diplomacy as uh, as the name of the, the, the office name. Uh, it used to be some, something like a cultural relations or something like that. But uh, from 2004, uh, the name has changed to public diplomacy. Uh, so uh, I think that was a direct uh, influence of American influence of public diplomacy onto the uh, Japanese public diplomacy.